Hello, 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 hello. Happy Friday, everyone. Yes, we're back. It's another Friday. Um, the weeks are just absolutely whizzing by, like whizzing by. Uh, it's like every time I feel like I think I'm going to slow down, it just doesn't happen. But I think that's the way the end of the year always is, don't you think? I mean, it kind of has this, this piece to it. All righty. So today we have part two. We have part two. How has your week been? Have you all had a good, good week? I mean, my week has been amazing. Um, as you know, I'm still here in South Florida. I am here for Art Week at this point. Um, yes, I'm visiting family and friends and lots of family and lots of friends, but really loving Art Week and Art Basel and everything that's happening around here. I feel like I'm going from one point of the city to the other. And anybody who's been to South Florida knows that Miami is humongous. I mean, Los Angeles is humongous. Miami is humongous. They're like the two places that I know of in the United States that like when I say Miami, I could be an hour and a half away and still be in what we call Miami. And so that has me going all around town, public transportation, uh, lifts, uh, <laughs> like driving, a little bit of everything. But it has been so enriching to see the art that's out there. Um, and to just see how many different types of art events there are in design and all kinds of different things. So I am posting a little bit as I go. I will be posting more um, when I get back and I, I have a chance to go through all my photos and, and just like, but there has been some really amazing plant themed, um, not just not just art it's really beyond that and that's why i want to gather my thoughts up and figure out how i'm going to put it together but there are a few exhibits that have been very focused on nature and plants and not just your traditional i'm going to paint them but really helping us get into the plant mind in different ways and i feel like there's still an opportunity for a lot more of that so um i don't know maybe we'll have a conversation in one of our upcoming events i need to think about what's the right setting for it um to where we can kind of examine i mean in our book club we really do get to it from the perspective of the writing side of it but i do think that from an artistic side of it there is even more opportunity to create um plant awareness events and experiences that that come through the artistic process and and i know we talk about it a lot here in different forums but i need to think about which one of us which one of our events would be the right forum for us to have a much more in-depth conversation that being said that as always is not what we're here for today today we are going to talk about art but we're going to talk about it in a completely different way so we're talking about uh, the paper that we started last week which is called poetry vegetality relief from being and this if you haven't had a chance to watch part one don't worry about it i will give you a road so far and then you can go um, i'll give you like a little like summary of what we where we ended up and then we you can go back and watch it at a later date it is here in the naturally conscious community and then um i still haven't restreamed it i sometimes restream to facebook and youtube and such but for right now it is in the naturally conscious community and this is the place for you to come to experience them live every Friday. So this paper was not what I expected it to be at all. Um, like I said, it's called Poetry, Vegetality, Relief from Being by Mark Payne. Um, I didn't really expect to be talking about vegetality, which is plantness, right? The, the vegetality is Mark uh, Michael Ma Martyr's way of expressing what we here in NCC as sprouts call plantness. It's the exact same thing. Um, and so he really, this paper by Mark Payne really goes into the idea of vegetality in poetry, but to kind of relieve us. So let me see if I can put this into words that make sense. Basically to help relieve us from the need, that forced need of that oftentimes comes with prose of putting in narrative significance to everything. So the, in essence, what he's trying to say is that vegetality of plantness, and he in this case is talking about it from a very positive perspective, is like if you look at the different kingdoms, not so much as a hierarchy, although he references Aristotle's um, hierarchy in the very beginning, but if you think of it more as a series of characteristics, the human characteristic is the characteristic of giving significance, of adding significance where um the animal um the animal significant the animal kind of characteristic 
like my animalness is my instinctualness. And this is kind of a little bit of a of a stretch of, of what he's trying to say. He says it between the lines, but this is my interpretation of it. And of course, as always, you can always correct me or change or if I say something that that is different from the way you understood it to be. But it's almost as if he's saying, as a human being, part of our like characteristic of the human kingdom, and it's not a kingdom at all, we know that humans are animals, but let's just play with it for a second. Uh, I don't have an actual word right now that's coming to mind, but the humanity of it, let's use that. My humanity is my ability to give significance or my need almost to create significance in order to touch the divine my animalness is my ability to be instinctual to react and to use that sort of natural intelligence more acutely and my plantness is my ability to be to um, respond to the environment to to be a part of the environment and so therefore in his definition and the way he's talking about it was breaking apart some of these connections of what it means to be divine into these sort of different aspects of it and he is talking about how poetry allows you to be that's really what he's trying to say and therefore is bringing out your more plantness side that's that's i think the essence of what he's trying to say so let me share my screen so that we can sort of jump back into where we were. That's kind of the overall synthesis of what he was talking about. Um, and I found it to be a really interesting discussion point and argument because I had never thought about it that way. I had never really put together this concept of beingness and plantness together. Um, yeah, so so that was a little different. Hold on a second. I just realized that I have. Ah, there's so many little settings, so many little things to change. Um, which is funny because I had just changed these today. And now I can't find what I need to change. Oh, there it is. Okay. So got it. Okay, let's start. Let's just jump into this. Sometimes it takes a minute to get everything up and working, but that's okay, because that's part of the fun of doing live, like being live. Okay, so here, I'm assuming everybody can see it now, here is our paper, Poetry, Vegetality, Relief from Being. And we were on page nine, or actually, were we on nine? No, we were on eight, excuse me, we were here. So here we were talking about specific poetry, and we're about to get into kind of another another section of poetry and i do like i said i found it interesting that he kind of in essence this is the part that i think besides this separation and this thinking about not separation but more of identifying major characteristics from each uh, category it's not really a kingdom because yes it's the plant kingdom but it's the animal kingdom but humans are are part of the animal kingdom and we haven't even gotten into rocks and you know others so minerals and such like that so let's just play around with the idea of if you think of a better word let me know category or ah, container so we have um i do find that interesting that he doesn't separate them out like saying one is better than the other but more of like just different characteristics on top of that, I found it really interesting that he that he's thinking of poetry in this perspective as relief from being, relief from needing to give such narrative um, significance. When in reality, so much of poetry is significance because you have such like less words. But I guess because you don't have all the syntax, like the strict syntax, although you can in certain forms of poetry, maybe that's what he means. Um, but I, well, I guess we'll get into it now and we'll find out. But I do find it's very interesting that poetry, which I believe to be much the, one of the most symbolic of all the languages, is the one that he thought, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> let's just jump in. All right. André, André Dubouchin was an editor of the journal Le Fre FM. No, FM. God, that's a hard word to pronounce it like the ephemeral, whatever. The other editors included Yves Bonfoy, Jacques Dupont, Michel Derry, and Paul Celan. The first issue carried as the sole item on its back cover a, quote, a quotation from Plotinus, 
that served as a kind of floating epigraph for the journal's ambition, a mini manifesto in the voice of another. What discourse is possible with respect to what is absolutely simple? And this is probably the essence of what he's talking, this whole paper is talking about, right? The idea of poetry being simple and therefore relief from being, and that is an enhancement of your plantness. It's almost as if you have to step into your plantness in order for you to simplify, to come down to its essence, to be, um, to allow things to be there and the significance be created from the experience rather than you having to dictate the experience. That's probably one of the best ways of, of describing it. The precise reference is not given, but Clément Leyer, in his edition of Du Boucher's Notebooks, cites more of the passages from Enneads in which it appears, in recognition of its longest importance from the, for the poet's thinking about how poetry should proceed in its encounter with the phenomenon of life. And what other charm can we find which has a sort of muse about it? The soul runs over all truths, and all the same shuns the truths we know if someone tries to express them in words and discourse thought and discursive thought for discursive thought in order to express anything in words has to consider one thing after another this is the method of description but how can one describe the absolutely simple no oh, that was powerful the passage expresses a contrast to which ploitinus frequently recurs between discourse as what cannot be cannot capture being in the simplicity of its presence and a kind of utterance that were to exist would be able to do so the new song or charm that by allowing the soul to express its apprehension of the oneness of being might allow it to glimpse what is beyond it beyond being this language to come cannot have the form of description since description like argument is a way through something description like argument is a way through something. I hadn't thought about that, but that makes sense, right? You have these two, you have the beginning point and your end point and the description is what passes through it. As opposed to, and I think that's what I was saying, that poetry, the other day we were in our, um, in our writing group, we were working on a love poem, on a self-love poem. And I was, as I was writing the poem, I was realizing we, we did a little exercise. If you've never come to the writing group, by the way, you have to come. It's awesome. Like our writing group meets every Wednesday and we write with no feedback. It's, it's uh, really, we write based on prompts and um, styles. Sometimes we really do exercise ourselves and play around a lot. It's a very, very safe space. Drop-ins always welcome. But in the writing group, one of the things, um, so we did this exercise to kind of prepare ourselves to write. So we prepared, um, we did a prompt around excavating, like the idea of going deep into yourself to then create material that then became the poetry. And what I realized through this poem, through this process, now that I'm reading this and I'm looking at this whole idea of since description like argument is a way through something, is that yes, when I was writing the first part of it, which was of course just written out description, I was describing uh, an event, an experience, and the whole point was to go from whatever you're feeling in this particular moment to the final emotion that was like these feelings of love. So I kind of had, my writing had a goal to it. As opposed to when I wrote the poem afterwards, it was really, I hadn't really thought about it until now, but it really was just being in it. Like the idea of literally sitting in each step. So, you know, I, I think I started it with the, the words blue paper because it was based on a, a love letter. And, and I could feel myself just sitting there with the blue paper. It wasn't a description. I didn't go farther into it. I just said blue paper. And it brought me back into that being of being with that paper in my hand. So I find this is interesting. It's kind of putting a little bit of um, thinking process to it and to the idea of that being. Um, OK, and so as a way through something and hence one thing after another, whereas the charm would consist in the first instance of an acknowledgement of an endless unity of being, of encountering the aporia of being from within it and not having it within one's power to fashion an exit from it discur discursively. 
Oh yeah, you're just there. Okay. Oh, I'm so curious as to how you're experiencing this, but I, I'm really like, it's almost visceral what he's saying to me. I, I can feel where he's trying to go with it and what it is. And I guess maybe this is a benefit of being really in touch with your plantness. Like it's almost as if he's saying this, I can shift into that feeling of myself, of my plantness, and I can sink into that place of being. Um, and this is the type of discussion that I would have never thought about to have or so I'm, I'm really curious as to how you're experiencing it. Do you see the connection between this idea of beingness and of plantness? Or am I just inventing it? Possible. I'm going to miss this cup. I'm going to miss this, this mug very much. I like big mugs like this. They're hard to come by in Italy. They're just really hard to come by. In his journals, De Boucher's effort to give expression to what he calls the interior avalanche of his confrontation with the aporia uh, of being is frequently figured through the omnipresence of the vegetal in its spreading out and self displayment. It's frequently figured through the omnipresence of the vegetal in its spreading out and self displacement. The expressiv expressivity of self uh, and the other thing to remember from part one is he loves words. loves words which is funny because this is his prose i wonder what his poetry is like like is the poetry simpler simpler in the words that he chooses because definitely this description has very fancy words the expressivity of self unfolding in the vegetal is not experienced as a manifestation of joy because its cause are out of sight and poems that mean to relay the encounter with vegetality should not themselves be effective. Why not? Poems that give joy are incomprehensibly weak and wither immediately. Visible nourishment is repugnant and the sources of sustenance must instead be invisible. What is he quoting? Oh, De Boucher. Interesting. The thought has ancient roots. Heraclitus's nature loves to hide, and an unapparent connection is stronger than an apparent one. Provide Debouche thinking, uh, Debouche's thinking with nourishment from the very beginnings of ancient reflection on the nature of the cosmos as a life world that is itself alive in all its parts. But the thought that what poetry must strive for is the inapparent relation between the strength of life and the source of life as it appears in plants has, as one might expect, its strongest roots, its taproot, one might say, in Plotinus. Ooh, I like this. I like this play on words. It's taproot. For Plotinus, plants are less obviously arranged as a set of organs in a hierarchical processing arrangement than animals are. Agreed. Because they have their life and its activity equally in all of their parts, their presence alongside us affords us a regular opportunity to reflect on how we apprehend the operation of life in the cosmos as a whole, as dispersed equally throughout its parts. Oh, this is a, a way of thinking about it that I hadn't thought about. As opposed to the intense presence of living activity as we encounter it in the eyes of an animal or in the face of a human being. Like the life of a plant, the life of the cosmos is everywhere at once as a signal of its being a home for other life forms. So that Plotinus can identify the way human beings make themselves at home in it with the way worms make themselves at home in rotting cabbage. I'm, I'm just picturing it. The homeliness of the cosmos does not manifest itself in the mode of an artifact, like a house that has been designed for human use, but rather in the mode of life. Its self-disclosure is the signaling of one living organism to another that is available to, to it to inhabit. The cosmos as plant stands for the ability to recognize the livingness of the life world as a home that comes into being from the source of life as itself, alive, and to misrecognize it as creation, a disposition of matter that is put together for its inhabitants in a more or less satisfactory way as craft work. Okay, I'm taking houseplants out of this because houseplants, of course, kind of have the idea of a pot and the whole thing, but I can, 
I can I can visualize what he's trying to say in this and what he's really trying to get into this whole concept of, you know, and we've talked about this a lot, right? Plants don't have a centralized, you know, a centralized system. They have this decentralized system that allows everything to be plant. And this is a question that we run into in different aspects when we cut, have a cutting and get a cutting from a plant. And from that cutting, a new plant sprouts. Is that a new plant? Is that the continuation of the existing plant? What is that? And when you compare it with the cosmos, it makes sense, right? It is the entire cosmos or the entire planet. For example, when we think about Gaia theory, that is the living being. And sure, you can break it down into these pieces, but there isn't this thing that like houses it or contains it or that splits it up. Sure, we can divide, but at what point in those divisions is it no longer the being that it is? And where in humans, we still can can sort of compartmentalize a lot more arms and legs and, you know, a head and all these different aspects. This is this is a really fascinating way of thinking about plantness that um, just gives another set of words to the expansiveness of looking at it from a plantness perspective. We cannot fully apprehend the livingness of the life of the life world as our home when we are at home in it precisely because it is a relationship between the living and the living. It is not seen properly if we think to view it from the outside as in, as in the contemplation of a non-living material object. Plotinus likens our apprehension of belonging to it to a chorus member's momentary understanding of their participation in a, chor in a chorus when the performer is briefly tuned towards the center of its movement. The evanescence of our apprehension of belonging to the world should not be understood as a problem for our self-experience, but as an in, as integral to the form of relational, relationality that is proper to the life form that we are. Captivated by our own animality, we are only momentarily able to look aside from it, to stand outside it and experience ourselves as subject of vegetality, like living beings as a whole. I love this line. Like, I don't know about you, but I just love this line. The idea of captivated, captivated by our own animality, we are only momentarily able to look aside from it, to stand outside it and experience ourselves as subjects of vegetality, like living beings as a whole. I think that this is my new definition of plant blindness. Because I think if you think about this as plant blindness, it is much more expansive, right? Yes, plant blindness is not being able to see like the traditional definitions of plant blindness. Um, or maybe this is that that distinction between plant despair. No, whatever. Plant blind was about to make it more complicated, but it doesn't need to be. Plant blindness, in it is true that it is the, our inability to see our plants, the plants around us. But it is also in a large part, the inability for us to see that plant is like vegetality is uh, is us in so many different ways right and so the idea of us to experience ourselves as subject like living beings as a whole right not divided into my like arms and my head and all these other pieces but like this whole being structure i think only in meditation are we really do we give ourselves permission to experience this feeling and that now makes the title make even more sense the whole idea of relief from being right the ability for me to just be my total essence and that is kind of the vegetal way of doing things poetry has let's see what where, where poetry fits in all this oh uh, let's see 16 did i miss that footnote most of the footnotes are usually references so i don't look at them anymore uh let's see martyr this was in reference up here where it was the line of because they have their life and its activity equally in all of their parts, their presence alongside us affords us a regular opportunity to reflect on how we apprehend the operation of life in the cosmos and as a whole as dispersed equally throughout its parts, as opposed to the intense presence of living activity as we encounter it in the eyes of an animal or the face of a human being. And this comes from Martyr. We've talked about Michael Martyr back. And if, you, if you're new around here and you don't know what Michael Martyr is, then go back 
and you can look through some of the older episodes and you will see all kinds of information about who he is. Uh, Martyr traces the history of this thought from the physicist physicist that loves to hide in Heraclitus's expression to vegetal life as dispersed, dispersed spirit in Hegel and Nietzsche, positively understood rather than as a primitive form of being in comparison to the life of animals, the dispersed life of, of a plant is a mode of being in relation to all the others, being qua, being with. Oh, being qua, being with. Okay, so it's just basically saying that this isn't rather of looking at it from a hierarchical perspective where we go from plants to animals to humans, but instead looking at this as a different form of being. We can be the animal being, we can be the human being, we can be the plant being, we can be the fungi being, we can be the micro being. These are just other forms of plant of being. All right, I'm not going to go through the other ones. Where are we? Poetry has an important role for Plotinus among Plotinus, Plotinus. I'll never get the like the the actual pronunciation right. So depends on where you're from. Potato, potato. Among the practices of reflection that can bring this apprehension of shared life forward, in the great images of the Aeneids, the plant that is the same throughout, no matter how far it extends itself the sun rising over the horizon, which gives itself to the eyes to see, the spring that empties itself into rivers, but is not exhausted by them. Poetic accommodations of the natural world are an analogy for theoretical understandings, not just because they avoid the sequential ordering of dialect and myth, but because the instantaneous holistic apprehension they allow originates in the sub-rational sense of shared life that poetry captures as still performance, a tableau vivant of the cosmos as a living life world. This reminds me of the paper that we went through, unintentional or undiscovered or unintentional landscapes. I think it was un undiscovered landscapes. This is an interesting, this is, has, there's parallels there. I need to go reread that one to, to see it. Sometimes these images come from lyric poetry, as in Plotinus's frequent turns to Pindar. Sometimes they are images sourced from Homer and treated as if they were standalone moments of lyric apprehension. Lyric apprehension is better than analog for contemplation than the sequential cognitive of dialect, of dialectic and narrative, because what is to be apprehended in the contemplation is the oneness of living beings and the lyric's shallow time. Its suppression of narrativity in favor of the unfolding of an expansive present tense affords such apprehension to human beings with respect to the larger horizon of shared life to which they belong. Plotinus's denarrativization of Homer is not violent towards his poems, but a recognition of the ways in which the natural forms of attention in reading, the tangency of attention drifts with respect to narratives of, of desire, Anal analogize, analogize, analogize our capacity to apprehend our belongings to shared life as a whole from within the self experience that is proper to the relentlessness forward movement of our own animal connotation. Toggling back to desirous consumption from dreaming by the book, to use Elaine Scarry's term. 20. Hold on. Let's see what we got. See, this is the thing the ones that I do see are the ones that are just like reference to who she is, where not the, eh, anyway. My, uh, see, toggling back to desirous consumption from dreaming by the book, to use Elaine Scarry's term, mimes, mimes, mimes the switch between the occasions of which we grasp the distant or scientific images of ourselves within the manifest or first personal images of our lives, only to lose it as the story inevitably progresses. Plotinus ex, uh, ev uh, evacuates, my goodness, evacuates time from his lyric reading of Homer, as lyric itself makes time to a sh into a shallow but expansive present, as an affordance of our shared life with plants, constellations, rivers, and springs that the Gnostics, his self-designated philosophical adversaries, oh, 22, as Hall, Michael Hall argues our inability to recognize the time frames of plant activity is constitutive of 
constitutive of our inability to perceive processes such as the abscission of, le of leaves as actions. I'm going to try to read that one again. Hall argues our inability to recognize the time frames of plant activity is constitutive of our inability to perceive processes such as the abscission of leaves as actions. Very true statement. Uh, going back, poetry stills the depth perception of time. I like this line a lot. Uh, hold on a second. Going back, going back to two sentences, because I might have gone a little bit in jumps. This is what happens, by the way. His self-designated philosophical adversaries refuses to acknowledge as living substance in the same way that our bodies are mediations of life itself. Poetry stills the depth perception of time inherent in animal connotation, in animal connation, so that the world comes into focus as a still performance of its own. It stages aliveness as a form of relationality that we might call a value-saturated apprehension of nodality. Our awareness of being situated among socialites of non-human life that are a reflective screen for our own, as the chorus is for the actor. I like this. Very interesting. So in real reality, what he's trying to, I mean, in reality, what he's trying to say is that poetry is, in, in Dom and Her, we have this expression that is like, uh, vivere l'attimo, live in the moment. Right. And basically what he's trying to say is that the poetry, because it is not describing an ongoing action, but more of taking a snapshot in time, allows you to be in that snapshot in time. And there goes back to the vegetality, because we don't necessarily see, even if we were to see the movement of leaves, for example, we don't think of that as a, even the movement of leaves in a in a tree for example is still in that moment it is not an action that's going from something to something which is what most narrative discourse is even if the narration is describing a scene you're almost still in action in the scene whether i'm walking through it i'm panning through it i'm experiencing it it's not as easy from a in prose for you to capture the stillness of something through the use of words. I think if you use the different medium, like if we were looking at film or something like that, you might through the use of silence, but um, then stillness, but without that silence and that stillness, it's still really hard. And so, but poetry instead is in some essence, even when it is motion, but it's still a snapshot in time, it feels like it. And so therefore we're experiencing that. So consider John Ashbery's poem, Some Trees. These are amazing, each joining a neighbor as though speech were a still performance, a raging by chance to meet as far this morning from the world as a green with it, you and I are suddenly what the trees try. To tell us we are that they're merely being there means something that soon we may touch, love, explain, and glad not to have invented such comeliness. We are surrounded, a silence already filled with noises, a canvas on which emerges, a chorus of smiles, a winter morning, placed in a puzzling light and moving, our days put on such reticence, these accents seem their own defense. What Ashbury's poem tells us is that the shared life of trees and our shared life with the shared life of trees almost has, a, has the form of speech. Or rather, it makes us see that an ideal form of speech would be present to us in a way that trees are present to us at such moments as this. When we apprehend in them a will to communicate to us something of their way of being in the world. What is to be apprehended would be there in its place as a still performance, without the need for narrative elaboration. As Richard Maybe puts it in his reflection on the site of Woodsworth daffodils, 
It is not so much the beauty of charismatic plants that moves us, although we are glad not to have invented that too, as it is the vague apprehension of a distinctive modality of shared life that we experience in their company. In the end, it was not so much their good looks that moved me as their presentness. I'm reluctant to say presence with its hints of some spiritual aura and means just be there being there at that place and in that moment, present in the sense of all present and correct. I was touched by the way they belonged to this spot and that its human inhabitants had been contributors to that persistence, not as hubristic cultivators managing and force breeding them, but as neighbors and companions. This is beautiful. I love this. And I, and I have to say, personally, this was probably one of my biggest experience with like the moment that I sort of had one of those pivotal moments that completely changed my life. Really, and, and it was thanks to the plants was something very similar to this. I was walking in the sacred woods um, of Dominher. I'll come back. But I was walking in the sacred woods temple of Dominher and I was walking through nature. And at some point, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I remember that all of a sudden I had this moment of that living in the, in the moment, right? I was present. Everything around me was present. I, and I've often said as a person who thinks very quickly and is oftentimes either reminiscing in the past or has been my past mo modus operandi was to reminisce a lot in the past or to be thinking a lot in the future. It is the plants that bring me into the present. Like when I sit in my plantness, it is what brings me and snaps me into where I am here and now, not in the what am I doing right now, but in the who am I, what am I, where, like, just now, like it doesn't even have this comprehension of words. So I can even understand more why the prose, why the, the narrative, why the lyrical just doesn't really fit that modus. Like it's just not, it's not gonna get you there. I had never, I had put it into words in the sense of, and, and this is one of the reasons why I work so closely with all of my clients and we work with the plants so closely because for many of us, we are separated from that beingness, from that being. Sure, we talk about acceptance, like accept who I am. Yes, we talk about like loving who I am, but these are all the verbs and the actions. The beingness, sure, again, it is a verb, but it's, it's, a, it's different and it's very hard to put into words and nor should we. So I can see now this plantness as being that element. And I can see how poetry would be um, such a great medium for that. For Ashbury and maybe, and maybe the expressiveness of these charismatic plants, persistence in place is the communicative modality of their, of their merely being there. It is what they transmit to us as hopeless, hopefulness about our own form of life. Perhaps we will explain ourselves like rational beings, but we will only do so properly if we have first experienced ourselves in the way that the trees and flowers give us back to life as a whole, as beings whose self-realization is expressed in the shallow time of vegetal persistence, as well as the peaks and troughs of animal conation. Uh, in this way, we come to understand how we too participate in the course of vegetal life as neighborhood joining neighborhood in a larger horizon of shared life. The individual instances of expressivity, of expressivity are not fully apprehensible between the different forms of life, but we gain some sense of their belonging together in a single shared life when we register the whole as a still performance. The apprehension is effervescent its proper duration appearing and vanishing in the shallow time of the lyric poem. Surrounded and chorus name two related modalities of being with shared life. With the non-factiousness, the non-factious, factitious, 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 that's the word, that's why it's not coming out, non-factitious beauty of the world. 
It's comeliness. By the way, totally quick aside, I love the word comeliness. And the first time I ever heard it was thanks to Dungeons and Dragons. So Dungeons and Dragons has its place in helping us expand our vocabulary because that's where I learned about the charm and beyond that is comeliness. Because my first character had really high comeliness rating. Really my only character. I didn't very play for very long. Anyway, that was that was just a st stupid aside for you. Okay. Uh, it's comeliness being the tipping point between the mere presence of the world and the sense we have in its presence that it is a world for us. A world for us. It is by us. It is, it is us. And the sense we have in its presence that is that it is a world for us, that it is merely that it's merely being there means something by virtue of our participation in it or of our creation of it. I mean, without us, it wouldn't be it would be different. Um, what the shallow time of Ashbury's poem captures apparatus like as still performance is the momentary understanding of belonging to a larger horizon of shared life as it appears in the vague apprehension of the collective sociality among the trees. The way that there are some trees, according to the poem's titles, in both their chorality and and in an identification with the processes of life that is stronger and more complete than their own than our own, excuse me. Their way of being together inspires a confidence in the speaker's attachment to life that is readily communicated to the reader. It is in this sense that the trees of Ashbury's poem can be said to know something about life and to be willing to communicate it to us. Aristotle in the Eudemian ethics argues that reaching out for life is common to all living beings. And that communicating what this effort feels like in particular life forms is the ultimate goal of a shared life in which human beings participate as members of the community of living beings as a whole. Interesting that this comes from Aristotle, but I guess because he's saying that um, it's common to all living beings, but each being does it with a different level of awareness. Because, I mean, Aristotle doesn't really believe in the awareness of plants or didn't really believe. All right, let's see what he says. It is clear that life is perceiving and knowing, and so shared life is shared perceiving and shared knowing. But perceiving and knowing are themselves the most to be grasped by every individual. And it is for this reason that reaching out for life is naturally implanted in all, for living must be considered a kind of knowing. This is from Aristotle. We Udemian ethics, shared life is the nominalization of a Greek verb that might also be translated into more active processual, processual sense as shared living. It is compound of the verb zen to live with the verb with the preverb sun meaning with or together. As Brill has noted, for all the reflection of the two ancient Greek words for life generated by Giorgio Agamben's homo sacer, Virtually no attention has been paid to what we learn about Zo from the fact that it can be shared or to the significance that the possibility of sharing in Zo has for the relationships between Zo and Bios. Well, that's another whole rabbit hole that I'm not going to get into right now. Plants, plants might seem to offer little help to human beings in the task of making their lives apprehensible as shared life less than animals who, even without language, are able to make their feelings clear to one another and to us. But plants' indifference in this regard is commensurate with the force with which they manifest shared life in Aristotle's first sentence. The common reaching out for life that is naturally implanted in all living beings by virtue of their becoming, of their being common subjects of life. As Plotinus puts it, plants enact the rela relationality to being that human beings call reflection by simply living as the life forms that they are, whereas human beings are excluded from realizing their relationality in this way because they are rational animals and have to articulate it discursely.
I'm thinking about this because up until now, and I hadn't said this before, but up until now, I had sort of let a few things slide to a certain extent or looked at them in the light most favorable to um, what we're talking about from the perspective of because he had quoted Martyr and Hall, um, there is an understanding of a plant of, of a plant co uh, consciousness or cognition happening, right? So I gave Mark Payne the benefit of the doubt in the fact that he was going down the path of citing martyr and company. And so therefore it means that he must not see this division that we've been talking about, about like plantness versus animalness versus humanness as in a hierarchical. And he says it at the beginning, sort of where he goes into the fact that it's not, not a hierarchical, but it's more of a division of like characteristics. Now, as he starts to cite Aristotle, I get a little <laughs> because as we know, Aristotle really did believe in the more hierarchical uh, scala naturae, you know, the whole idea that like plants are basically living but inert, um, not just from a movement perspective, but from a cognition perspective, and then moving through animals and stuff like that. So I, I, I sort of get a little bit reticent here of where he's going, and I'm trying to still look at it for the for the purposes of our discussion, to be honest, I think, and this is my so just so that you know where I'm coming from in this, I try to be as impartial when it comes to certain types of discussions because I don't want to necessarily bias myself for in the sense of, or and I don't want to bias all of us. So when we're talking about things like plant cognition or when looking at some of the scientific papers, I try to be as much as possible somewhat you know, kind of showing both sides of it to the best of, of my abilities. In something like this, I, I think that there's a greater benefit to our community because we are not talking about scientific thought that is being put out there as like hard truths, but this is more of an interpretation of a role or of a better, deeper understanding of how some, how some elements of the arts can help us not only better express our relationship with plants, but our own plantness. I feel like it's not as important for us to get into the nitty gritty details of like, well, Aristotle thought this thing and he thought plants were stupid. So therefore, if he's referencing Aristotle in this perspective, he's actually, it doesn't matter, honestly. I think for our purposes, what's most interesting from a conversational and an elaboration and a processing and a paradigm shifting is for us and it, and again i you know please feel free to add into the comments if you think of this in a different way if you think i should be going in a different direction i mean i'm always open to having this conversation and this is a great type of conversation we can have deeper in um our interspecies sprouts gathering right our kind of networking and gathering event that happens every third wednesday of the month in NCC, in our, our community. So that's a great place to have this conversation even deeper, but I'm totally open to having it via the chat and comments if you're reading, if you're uh, listening to the replay. I think it's much more favorable to us, much more useful to us to sort of think of this as what we want. That doesn't say I ignore what I think Aristotle was trying to mean. I just think it's not worth it to give him energy. So I think it's much better for us to start to redefine some of these terms, not by saying Aristotle thought this, but more of like, how do I take Aristotle's thinking? And if I look at it with the knowledge that we have today, remembering that he didn't have this knowledge back then, the knowledge we have of plant cognition, of what's coming out of plant neurobiology, of who plants are and the beings that they are and what we're discovering. And if I apply all of this new knowledge to the words to the, the beliefs, not the beliefs, but more of the observations that Aristotle has, how do I reinterpret his, inter his um, writings? And again, that is not to try to rewrite history, well, kind of a little bit, but it's more of giving us an updated understanding based on what it is. So that's, I just wanna say that because as we start to get into some of these Aristotle pieces, it's very, it's, I, I, it's not that I'm not cognizant of the fact that Aristotle didn't believe that plants were intelligent. I am very, very cognizant of this. 
but I am choosing to say, what would Aristotle think today to give the benefit of the doubt that if I was to say to Aristotle in today's world, if I could zap him here and be like, hey, look at all of the science that has now come out, how would you reinterpret the words that you wrote? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, as Plutus, yeah, as Plotinus puts it, plants enact their, rela their relationality to being, to being, that hum to being with a capital B, that human beings call reflection by simply living as the life, as the life forms that they are, whereas human beings are excluded from realizing their re relationality in this way because they are rational animals and have to articulate it discursely. I would say more than anything because we have a lot of trauma. Um, and that's the reason why. So yeah, discursively true, because we have to work through our thoughts, because we have a lot of actually not because we have a lot of trauma, I think actually, because we have a lot of conditioning. And I think that this is really the biggest difference. Um, I think that plants, maybe because they're older species, I, I mean, we do see that they have some levels of conditioning, but we also see how much the plants are able to adapt to a new set of information where we get stuck. And that's, I think, one of the biggest aspects that we can learn from plants, which is a plant comes into the world with a series of knowledge, information, and beliefs, quote unquote, um, that are based on the experiences that the parents have. So as a seed growing up and as that first budding um, and sprouting into life. But in order to survive, the plant has to then assess the current situation on a regular basis and cor not correlate, um, confront those th that reality, the reality of what's happening today with the reality of my past, and then take the best path based on that. And I think that that's where what, what mechanism we as humans have lost. It is okay to come and bring in tradition and thoughts from my family and from my culture and from all kinds of things. But if I am not able to correlate that with what's happening in the present and then make new decisions that are not just based on automatic responses, but instead are based on all the data available to me. And this is what I was talking about relating to Aristotle. So using that same plant approach, which is if Aristotle was given new information, would Aristotle's writings and thoughts be different? And I choose to believe that he would have to actualize, he would have to modernize his thought process because he's gaining new information. And that's where I'm choosing to read this. Uh, the plant has a clarity on, in its relation to being that is denied to us in the selectivity of our animal conation. I disagree, it's denied to us. I think we, we have been, again, for the reasons that I just stated that I'm not gonna repeat. It enacts its obscure donation without reserve in its merely being there. Oh. As du, uh, du Boucher puts it in the form of poetic reflection, the trees wanting to explain its the tree wanting to explain itself and producing nothing but leaves, leaves upon leaves. That's a nothing. The single-mindedness of vegetal being. Okay, see now we're starting to get into these. Now we're starting to get where Michael Payne or Mark Payne has switched from a martyr hall approach more into an Aristotle approach. And so I'm going to try to limit my commentary to try to stay on task because if not, I might go off on the sides. The single, I might go off on like a tangent. The single mindedness of vegetal being comes to fascinate Heidegger too. I just love saying the word Heidegger. I don't know why. Heidegger, Heidegger. Jeffrey Nealon has recently drawn attention to Heidegger's call in the fundamental concepts of metaphysics to translate physis not as washtum, which we talked about in the first episode, so you might want to go back to that one to understand that, but as Walt, as Walton, Nealon glosses this rethinking of physis as a power of emergence that remains indifferent to this or that form of life, to this or that individual being of its world or its world noting its importance for Derrida in the beast and sovereign too, as the self-constituting, self-formed sovereign predominance of beings in their totality. As Derrida himself puts it, in this conception of physis as a Vulcan, man is not its mastered, he is mastered by it. I need to read the, the wider, 
I want to make a comment, but I'm not actually sure if the comment is accurate because it's like man is not mastered. He is mastered by it. It's those two extremes. What about like, you know, a little partnership there? But Heidegger's own words are more forceful still. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to read the German. Physis is what powers through and around the human being. Heidegger is here reviving the ancient recognition of the clarity with, his, with which physis is visibly in the lives of plants. This recognition goes hand in hand with an acknowledgement that, that dis, oh, this is the word from last week, descends, descends, descends apprehension of the form of its surroundedness by living beings as a whole is what affords it the capacity to articulate its relationship with beings as such. In being and time, the they world of, hum of human sociality allowed the saint to shun the responsibility for articulating its relationship with being. In the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, by contrast, Heidegger recalls Plotinus' culminating image on, uh, in On the Good or the One, where organismic life is in its totality is figured as participation in the movement of a circular course. And what this participation affords is a momentary, a momentary apprehension of the relationship between life and being. The essential feature of the circular movement of philosophy does not lie in running around the periphery and returning to the point of departure. It lies in the view at the center that is the circular course alone can provide. The center that is the middle ground reveals itself as such only in and for the movement that encircles it. See, I like this description a lot. The essential feature of circular movement in philosophy is not about right. And this is, I think, goes back to what they were talking about in poetry is like when you talk about any kind of discursive narration, you have to describe going around it, whether you're going from point A or point B or whether you're going from point A and going back all the way around to end up at point A. Whereas in the poetic realms, it's almost as if you're always from the center and you're just there in it. You're in the immersed in it. Um, yeah, I like that. I like the way that 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 feels good to me. The plant's emergence into the space of life exhibits a sovereign indifference to the others. By the way, I've been talking about indifference quite a bit recently because it keeps coming up indifference is a positive word not a negative word um it comes up I've, I've talked about this in previous streams i've talked about it in master classes we need to start re-looking at the word indifference because i think a lot of people when they see it look at it as a negative as like i don't care it's not i don't care it is i care but i'm okay if it changes and from a plant perspective that's very much true I care, I want this, I'm going in this direction, but if something changes, I'm going to adapt and I'm going to move with that. And that's really the core of indifference. I'm not attached to something, I am going with it and I'm giving it that energy, but I'm also willing to shift it. A sovereign indifference to the others who are always already there before it. It is not interpolated by them. It is not tempted out of the form of relationality to being that is single-mindedly enacts and it's coming into being and passing away. Figuring the choral presence of vegetal being in its more forceful reaching out for life is fundamental to Descent's capacity to imagine its surroundedness by the life world. And this in turn is foundational for its capacity to articulate its self-experience as a local historical form of relationality with being. In the origin of a work of art, the Greek temple gathers around itself, the shared life of a people by giving lasting expression to their relationship with the living beings that surround them. And in the lecture course of Sophilis's Ode to, the Man, Ode to Man, the Greek polis becomes polos, the pole, the swirl, in which, in which and around which everything turns, so that the polar concerns being in that around which such beings as manifest themselves turn. Uh, Heidegger, in being and time, shared life beyond the human is merely hinted at in the acknowledgement that the form and intensity of Descent's interpolation by the they is a matter of variation within the historical form of human life. These hints are continuously are continuous with the feelers that Heidegger occasionally extends towards anthropology in order to acknowledge alternative modes for the calling of singular Descent into human sociality as what always 
uh, already precedes it and affords it the possibilities for its form of life. I don't think that any of these folks really understood their plantness as much as this paper is bringing out of them. And I find that really absolutely fascinating. Okay, wait, it's already at the top of the hour. So let me just see how far we have. We have this page and this page and this page. So we have three pages. Oh, no, here. I am going to try to go through it without going into too much commentary just to hold us back because I feel like we really do need to close. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Um, Poetry has remained in contact with the ancient pastoral traditions, easily accommodates a staging of vegetal physis as the form of life that enacts its relationality with the source of life more powerfully than humans do in theirs. The disenactment of narrative cremation is one instance of this accommodation, whereby it makes its own appearance akin to the total sovereign emergence of vegetal physis in the shallow time of its merely being there. The work of the American poet Gustav Soben clarifies what is at stake here by coupling the emergence of poetic form with the kinds of existential risk and shared life that we have already noted in the pastoral tradition. Soben moved to Provence in the mid 1960s to be close to René Char, and like the work of his near contemporary André du Bouchon, his work is shaped by sustaining engagement with the Greek ecological thought. Greek ecological thought. I'm going to have to go look that up. And by a distinctive mise en page with that stages a life risk in, stake, in staking the, per, the perdurance of self-experience on the forms of relationality a particular terrain affords. Animals appear throughout Sabon's work as figures for the proxy seeing enabled by this gesture of risk as poet and animal alike wage their singularity as the possibility of common attunement to a shared space of life. Sobin calls this attunement blossomy, not because it is flourishing. Ha, interesting, both the names of our levels, blossomy, blossoming sprouts. <laughs> like we have blooming, actually mine was blooming, not blossoming, but it's the right time. Blooming sprouts and flourishing sprouts. In the neo, in the neo uh, Aristotelian, sense of realizing the capabilities proper to a particular life form but because animals are flowers in the sense of in the scene of life because animals are flowers an agitated foreground drama played out against the more powerful background presence of vegetal beings as the continuous productivity of what is because animals are flowers in the scene of life, an agitated foreground drama played out against the more powerful background presence of vegetal being. Vegetal physics is overwhelming. It's whatever those words are, no, it's German, powering through and around him. The first fact of phenomenal experience, the vegetal earth sucks at our voices, el toto and most compellingly so in the plants demand that we articulate our shared life with it. This lazing grain that bends the eye and forces the white breath to feed. In the face of this sovereign power of vegetal life as emergence, human and animal are, are alike subdued, and it is this adequation of animal lives with regard to vegetality that Sorbin names with its model from classical pastoral, idol. Animal and human are interchangeable, not in the biopolitical sense that the life of the animal provides the ground for treating the human as a biopolitical unit, but because each apprehends itself as the risk of the other. The common evanescence of animal activity against the larger horizon of vegetal becoming. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier in the beginning, right? It's almost as if the animal is the verb and the, the vegetal is the noun. It is, and, and this isn't to say, you know, last time I had talked about the, the, the overstory and how I wondered that had uh, Richard Powers thought about like the plants in the overstory in this way, how different would a book be? In part, he kind of does it now as I read through this in the sense that it is the plants in the overstory. And I'm, I'm now having a different, different appreciation for some aspects. 
the plants in the overstory are to a certain extent the beingness of all of these human characters that are moving in and out of those spaces. It is the plants that represent those trees that are mentioned for each one of those characters that represent the rootedness, the beingness, the essence to a certain extent of each one of those characters. I think if he would have allowed himself some permission to play around with um maybe different styles like not just the narrative but giving the plants that their essence expressive maybe through poetry or through other elements in the book could we have better felt that presence that the narrative form didn't allow them to be for those of us that are like very plant focused we just felt them in a backdrop but not as a forefront of the beingness that they are to complement or complete the activity of the human being. I don't know. It's just me thinking out loud, which is what I did last time a lot. So take it with a grain of salt. And I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about it. Like, does that make sense? Is that me going a little bit too far? I don't know. Curious. Sobin was present at the talks Heidegger gave in uh, Le Thor at Char's invitation in 1966 and 1969. In section five of A Portrait of the Self as Instrument of Its Syllables, published in the collection Voy Voyaging Portraits, he offers an account of hearing Heidegger read and talk about uh, Hudelin's poem fragment, that word, and how he came, this word right here, and how he came to relate this exposition to the retrospective understanding of his own poetics and he articulates, uh, that he articulates in the poem, how he had brought the broken swarm, oops, excuse me, of his syllables to the terrain where he found himself so that it might take like a cutting or a graph the damp vocal sprout i like that metaphor the wearless workings of a scuttled earth became a here in his work through the co-forming of poem and place as a space of shared life of mitsan uh or mitsan the poem works out what it is to articulate shared life by bringing the life of the poet that has been dispersed into the things of the earth in into reaching out for life back into a human life world as where that has been constituted in poetic language. This is what I was talking about for Richard Powers. Like he could have mixed that in. That might have made, I know it was a huge success of a book, but I don't know, I think it could have been better. And then allowed my opinion. I'd love yours. A portrait of the self as instrument of its syllables is a retrospective, reflective understanding of how the relationship between poesis and mitsan has come to look in the light of a poetic project that is now constituted in the volumes of poetry that precede it. Voyaging Portraits is Soban's fourth collection and the first to offer such a retrospective reflective, reflection. Articulations of poesies in the volumes that preceded are enacted as living thinking, as live thinking, sheer emergence in the present. What was lived, what was lived as a risking of self-experience among living beings as a whole is now understood retrospectively as the possibility of relief. Uh, Senchen Lastum offered itself as the possibility that attesting to relationality with living beings as a whole might stand up for the responsibility to articulate a relationship with beings as such for subjects of life who are not inhuman enough to hear what we hear. Not inhuman enough to hear what we hear. Wow, that's, that's a phrase. Discursive incapacity turns out to have been an approximation to vegetal physis. The self that wanted to explain itself but could not instead produced leaves upon leaves. Animal studies have had a great success in articulating the, the transformative potential of the encounter between the singular human being and the singular non-human animal. Aldo Leopold and the wolf, Hemingway and the elephant, Derrida and his cat are conversation narratives that emerge from a meeting of the eyes, a high stakes exchange of intense individual animal subjectivities. But scaling out from such encounters between singular animals is ever more difficult to articulate our vague and fleeting sense of solidarity with living beings as a whole. As Ursula Heiss says, I like that, by the way, I really do like that. 
our vague and fleeting sense of solidarity with living beings out hold. This is the whole reason why, as you know, I struggle with my words. The more I connect back into my plantness, the more I search, the more I have to search for obscure, not often used words in the English vocabulary in order to try to give some kind of vocabulary and why I appreciate this medium, this ability for me to express and convey beyond just the written word that allows me to not just use my language, but my gestures, my feelings, my emotions, because I still feel like I have to transmit so much that I receive from my plant, from the plants that I work with, that I have to transmit it from an energetic perspective almost, and from a gest gesticular, like the other day, um, actually in our writing group again, I felt like I was I, I, I had to describe what my body was experiencing because if I had to really answer that prompt, I would have danced. I would have gotten up and danced. And I should have. I should just have put my little tripod up and recorded a dance because that was what was coming. That was the best form of expression for that moment of beingness of that of what the plants were transmitting to me in that moment. Um, and that was what I really wanted to use. So we need to find ways and today's media centric society does give us more avenues for this sure right now the most of the videos that you're watching are you know like the dance they're kind of like you know more for show but not so and but there are those moments that you see those expressions that are coming through and i think for those of us that are working very closely with plants in so many different perspectives from both personal and professional please encourage you're encouraging you to use other forms of expressions to really experience that, to really allow that to come out of you in other ways, because I feel like that's going to be the best way for you to give a true and accurate representation of what you're receiving directly from the plants that is not going through a tied traditional language model. As Ursula Heiss argued, this is the least, at least in part, a question of genre. While narrativity has adapted and proliferated to capture the characteristic shapes of conation in the lives of human and non-human animals, it is not nearly as adept at giving communicative expression to the lives of living beings whose temporality and forms of action are unlike our own. Ah, ho, this is a, exactly what I just said. Read on, tigria, read on, because this is exactly what I said. Poetry, however, can put us back in touch with the vague background awareness of shared life that the Greeks called vegetality as we experience it in the connection with the life of plants. The shallow time of poetry offers an affordance to vegetality as the basic form of being together in the plural, the living present of still performance that we apprehend in ecstatic moments of self-neglect and distraction from our own projects. Greek poetry in the pastoral tradition is rich in stagings of the relief from animal conation that vegetality affords, especially in the charismatic appearance of trees and flowers, but it has no name for this sense of relief, nor does Plotinus offer one in his rich retrospective gleaning of the Greek poet tradition, pre Greek poetic tradition for its insights in this regard. Given that this sense of release also frequently involves a displacement of the question of being, onto living beings as a whole, I have called this charismatic gesture of the poetic tradition relief from being. And I like that it's being with a capital B because it's much, it's that expansive cosmos being. After Heidegger's, that word, poetry, it is in this sense predisposed towards life. It manifests us to ourselves as living beings that have something in common with plants, animals, and other human beings that is other than and more important to us than mere facticity. Poetry figures a solidarity with the living that, that uh, I think it was just meant to have one there, it was a, with the living that we do not experience in the company of plastic bags, dishwashers, and satellites. It expresses as a fellow feeling of common subjects of life that has grown up alongside one another where life is what has always already claimed us for itself, even though it animates us in different timescales. Life, de Boucher says, is the only thing we can imagine. At a moment when human beings appear to be on the brink of choking themselves and living beings as a whole with their inorganic refuse, we should ask ourselves about the meaning of this predisposition. 
Is this tide of waste not the overwhelming form of the obscure donation of what is at this point in time? Is a reckoning with the carbon and plastic not the most urgent task for ontology and poetry alike? Is poetry's inclination towards life not a way of hiding from ourselves the consequences of our own conation by sentimentally reattaching ourselves to the objects of our harm? Under these circumstances, we can still learn something from the relief from being that poetry affords us. Poetry is willed form for our, of our desire to inhabit a cosmos of shared life. By recognizing it as such, we give ourselves a way to move beyond the limitation of narrative genes, of genres in our confrontation with the spectacle of animal lives, our own included, stifled by the waste products of human self-realization. In poetry, we see what we'll be missing when our solidarity with the living is occluded to the point of inaccessibility by the obligation to reckon with the stuff of our making. Wow. It's a very good closing line. In poetry, we see what we'll be missing when our solidarity with the living is occluded to the point of inaccessibility by the obligation to reckon with the stuff of our own making. Alrighty then, that was poetry, vegetality, relief from being. Um, wow, powerful ending. I am a bit at a loss for words. I mean, I have said a lot of words, but I am very curious as to what yeah what do you get out of that i mean that is definitely not the type of paper i think we thought we were going to be doing uh, here but wow and i do that relief from being that relief from being in the perspective of like he got me with the ending man he really did he got me with the ending i feel like there's so much he said in that last piece that could have been a paper in and of itself because he only introduces this whole perspective of the inorganic refuse refuse that we should you know that we need to define that we need to give an understanding and so therefore we need this relief from being because we're sort of swimming in this all and but I wish he would have, I kind of wish he would have brought this in in other parts. I, or maybe he's setting us up for another paper. I'll go look and see if he ever wrote another paper around that specific topic. What do you think about this? Like, how do you see this entire conversation about how he looks at poetry? What are, our, it's, what are its characteristics and the allowance that it does? But more importantly, how he brought this all around that says, you know, that really this is what um how do we then use that same medium to help us better understand where we are in this point of time and and that line he says is poetry's inclination towards life not a way of hiding from ourselves the consequences of our own conation by sentimentally reattaching ourselves to the objects of our harm so it's i think he's trying to say that that poetry is more than it's a very powerful tool to have in your toolbox that can be used when you need to be when you need also to to relief from being like there's many different perspectives so i am I'm going to sit with this one for a while, but thank you so much for being here. For those of you that stayed all the way through to the end, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're watching the replay, know that I appreciate you just like I appreciate all people who watch this. And I would love to hear your thoughts and your feedback. Um, I, I like Carol says, you know, I like the idea that with poetry, we are at the center and not in linear time. I, I do. I agree with you. Um, Carol, I think that perspective and the idea of shallow time in a positive perspective, the idea of I am at the center and also I am here in the present. And yes, I'm observing, but I'm not observing it like a timeline, but I'm more of like observing it as a frame in time and as a really being. I do think that that's an extremely powerful aspect of this tool, which allows us to also be with it while not necessarily being um participant in it it's almost like 
it's the, that's that, that kind of beingness. It's not, a, I'm participating in it, but more of, of just experiencing it. And I think that that's part of also the relief from being, how do I better analyze something or how do I better experience something when I just experience it rather than feeling like I'm, I'm having to go through it, which um, happens in the, in, in regular prose. So uh, there's just so much here to digest. And I am just, again, super appreciative that you took this journey with me and that I am looking forward to having all your thoughts. And of course, I've gone over time. I'm trying to be better at that, but the papers are long and it doesn't make sense to do a third part for this. So thank you for being here. And um, until next week, we will see each other. Next Friday, please take note of the time because we have our first mini discussion of uh, the book club, of the Plant Wisdom Book Club, and there those were historically at the same time. So uh, this is actually going to be our plant, um, our, our plant commentary, our plant consciousness commentary is going to be an hour later. So just keep an eye in the Naturally Conscious community in your events, all of the hours, all the timings are correct there. And until then, I will see you next week. Remember, resist the urge to hold back your evolving green brilliance. Bye for now.